Hey everybody, this is Scott Homan with the Witness Underground podcast. Today we have a really special guest. This is Sean Walmsley, who is our story editor on Witness Underground, the documentary. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing good. It's been a whirlwind last few months with the Kickstarter. But yeah, things are good. Um, it's really interesting because you, you and I never actually had a conversation um, about how the film was made. And so I wanted to... Um, talk about some of those things, how we did it, what were some of the challenges and get into some of the weeds about decisions on, and this film it's now it's become a, a six year long, actually it's like, I'm like eight years into this topic, um, yeah. making content on the topic. <laughs> and so thank you for being a huge part of, of making the film a success. The film won an of award, it went to 11 festivals, uh, but you're a big part of that. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Yeah. And, you, and you have a novel out, but like, are you still doing work with film and editing? Is that still part of your... No, I kind of moved away from it. I think I wanted to tell my own stories, but I do value my time as an editor a lot. What are some of the other projects you worked on um, with film that were of note? Ooh, I did a year at a marketing agency, which was interesting. Um, Did a lot of advertising. Um... Other than that, it's very difficult to find projects that are that you can really put your heart and soul into. I think and this was one of them for sure. Um, but I, I think I started to move towards telling my own stories eventually. Uh, but yeah, what's the topic really of your? No. What's the topic of your own story? Just to give an idea for anyone who wants to check out your book. Oh, it's a romance novel. It's like a complete 180 from what I'm used to. Usually I'm into like horror and thriller, but I kind of stumbled into romance. Uh, the name is The Devil Drinks Mocha, part one, under my <laughs> other name, Sean Krubeck, because I was editing okay. with my maiden name, Sean Wormsley. Yeah. So if you like romance, check it out. <laughs> so is it is it a true story based on your relationship with, oh, no. with your no, no, husband? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> that would be like in my dreams. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not autobiographical then. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's a it's a fun title. What's the title again? Um, with mocha. The devil drinks mocha. The devil drinks mocha. Cool. I have to check that yeah. out. I'm excited for you. That's a really it's an important step. I have quite a few friends, and a lot of people got involved more recently with the film or authors. And, mm -hmm. um, turns out if you want to run a crowdfund, having authors on your team is better than musicians. No offense to my musician friends that helped out, but <laughs> uh, authors write all day and Kickstarter is basically all about writing people or running any mm -hmm. kind of crowdfund. Um, so it's interesting to find out, okay, one of our other film crew members are, is also an author. Like, okay. Yeah. There's a trend here. But... I should write a book. I think. <laughs> yeah, you should do it. I'm actually thinking about that's a whole side thing, but we launch into separately. But I, I actually, because of all the authors that have come, been attracted to the Witness Underground project and have been on the show as an interviewee um, and, I've, you know, want to help promote their books that I, and I have, I have like a collection, half of my laptops right now stacked on a bunch of my journals from when I was a teenager to my early twenties. And I brought them with me. I'm now living in Central America to, to dive into my past and to write a memoir, self-help memoir, like every other chapter, something mm. else. So that's, so I'm also trying to dive into my personal story where like the witness underground is that in a sense, it's autobiographical because my story is so similar. I'm not in the film and my story is not in the film. I, I realized that I kind of want to do, I'm almost on a similar trend as you maybe a few years past <laughs> behind. Um, but want to put my story out in a more serious way. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it's a really interesting journey because like, yeah, now I have skills for filmmaking, but like, maybe I should write a book. It's like a whole different world, right? Yeah, it is. What were, um, let's get into the movie and the process. Yeah. You had done a few films before that or, or like at the same time as Witness Underground. What, what is your process in general? It depends with, I did a couple of documentary shorts before Witness Underground. Um, and I've also done some narrative 
a feature length narrative film, very independent. I think it's streaming now somewhere. It's called Darkness Has Covered My Light, I believe. It was a very long time ago. <laughs> With narrative film, you get a script and you, you just kind of follow the script, you pull the footage together. With documentary, usually a director will come to you as an editor and say, here's a general idea that I had when I recorded this, uh, but here's everything that I have. <laughs> make it make it work turn it into something yeah um so and then we had that conversation <laughs> i remember exactly yeah. where i was when we, you and i had that conversation I was like where standing on a street corner outside of an alley in denver in south broadway like one one block off of the main um drag south broadway and mm -hmm. just like pacing back and forth, having this conversation like well i've got like 12 interviews but five of them are really important and they're all tied together and I think there might be a story there that like, I, I just, it's all foggy in my mind, but I think let you're like, are you sure? And I was like, no, but I, I'm just going to give you the footage and like, <laughs> and then you kind of had it for a long time. And I was just hoping that it like, I was just like, hail Mary, like Sean, save this. I'm so emotionally exhausted by this story. Can you please make my vision come true? <laughs> I have 12 yeah, I, or 15 I, I hours that. of footage or something. Yeah, I got that, that impression from you that you'd put so much of your time and your own resources into filming and traveling and, you know, you wanted to make something. But I think you were getting to a point where you might have been burnt out by the whole thing. Maybe I'm yeah. Yeah, no, no, interpreting no, that wrong or not. So, I took on such, it's such a big task to make a movie and it's such yeah. a big task to do a crowdfund. Um, it's such a big task to do the production of a movie. I, I, when I first crowdfunded, I was like, Oh, I make videos all the time. I've been doing this for eight, seven, eight years or whatever with my other projects in Vietnam and my music stuff and my music documentary that I was, I was still sort of editing it, but I, I put out a cut anyway. I was just like, I could probably do this. I don't know by the end of the year, but like mm -hmm. the day I prepped for th two months for the crowdfund to launch and get some funding to do the movie. And the day it was March 1st, 2018. When I pushed launch on Seed and Spark for crowdfunding, I was like, I cannot believe that this is the beginning. I'm burnt out. And then it was like 16 hour days um, for 30 straight days without any breaks at all. And it was insane. And the first two weeks we got like, it was like 20% funded. And it mm -hmm. took the first, that was like half of the campaign to get like 20% funded. I was like, this is a failure. Oh my God. Anyway, so like I was, by the end of the crowdfund, I was like, beyond burned out and then we went and shot it like the next month and that was like eight crazy days when that was already enough to be burned out and then then i went and shot like five more interviews and over the course of like a month and a half with other people unrelated to the topic but like for the same general project so when you and i finally talked i was back in denver i'd driven it was all minneapolis wisconsin i drove back to denver and it was like no way I can't, I can't even like think about this topic anymore. <laughs> and it was, it was six, it was June, I think. And we'd st I'd started like preparing for this in, in January 1st. So it's like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm five, six months into chaos <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, and then the, I never even heard, well, I'd heard of a story editor and I knew I wasn't good at it. And then you and I had worked on the Ross episode for XW coming out, which was mm -hmm. like the pilot episode, um, which you knocked it out of the park. I remember that too. Cause I would like spent like six months making like three cuts and you looked at them and you're like, I can take that and turn it into one cut. That's like 10, 15 minutes long. And I was like, no, and you hated it. <laughs> no, actually it's <laughs> so good. It's so good. It's so good. And that's why, like, I was like, I think, I think we can do this. She's already proven that she can take a complicated personal story and turn it. And it's like my, my, my passion project and turn it into something that I'm proud of. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the process wasn't smooth. So maybe we can talk about some of that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. okay. So you're going into the, I am cutting in so, so much here, but no, I good. gave you the, the fuzzy, this is my vision, make it real. Yeah. Uh, then, then what's uh, the next step for you? I just watched all the interviews one after the other, start to finish, um, took notes, kind of pulled key quotes from everyone. Hmm. And then... Yeah, I start with interviews exclusively. I think that is the the foundation of a documentary is the interviews, the people, the voices. And then once you have that down, then you start putting in your B-roll or your 
the footage of the people doing things that might relate to what they're saying or the archival footage. Um, and you kind of build up from there. So it was just about taking all of their stories and trying to figure out a way to make an audience member interested if they've never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses before, um, care about the people that they're listening to for what's the, I don't remember the runtime exactly. It's 83 minutes. The final version is 83 minutes. Oh, right. Okay. There's been so many versions. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll get into that. <laughs> and try, I'm just trying to create, uh, like just, you know, peaks and valleys, like not, not necessarily like with interest and boredom, but more like, this is a really interesting bit. Now that we've done the info dump on you, we're going to get personal now and then we're going to bring it back and then, you know, give people hope by the end of it. So that was my process really was, was just listening, taking notes and then kind of doing the jigsaw puzzle of putting it all together. So that we would focus on different sections of the film. I feel like the intro was like, this is what uh, nuclear gopher was and how it started. And then it became, okay, this is like the Jehovah's witness part of it. And now we're moving into like the evolution of these people's lives, like how mm. they got out of it, how they pushed through something so difficult and kind of ending it on a, on a sort of bittersweet note, really, because it's awful, you know, what some of these people went through, but it's also a joy that they got through it and music helped them. So yeah, that was my Actually, process. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's a really nice way to define what the chapters are and that there's about three chapters or three, yeah. three significant chapters. Um, they're not all the same length. And there's, there's one, the part, the middle part about Jehovah's Witnesses, it's kind of like Ryan tells his awakening story or his like big yeah. epiphany moment. Yeah. And so much of our back and forth. And we had another, our producer, um, associate producer, Ryan Duvall, was giving a lot of feedback as like a third person between you and I were doing all the work. And he was like, yeah, well, you know, what about this? What about that? And giving another, another viewpoint, which is really, really helpful. Um, and we had many, many iterations and many, many back and forth over the course of a year for that. But one of the things that he kept saying was like, this is the most important part of the film. It needs to start there. That's the, sh that's the hook, which I don't know that he's right or wrong there. We, you and I ended up making all the actual final decisions, but it's funny because we kept on trying to put that moment earlier and earlier in the movie. And, and it just kept on having, there's so much like the, the first 30 minutes of the movie is so jam packed full, accomplishing so many things. It accomplishes humanizing the characters um, to get you to care, as you said, which I think I've to label it as humanizing. It's like, well, yeah. most films don't show you who a real occult member really is. And like, yeah. here's a way to do that, which makes this film so unique. Um, it's not that other films don't do it, but like you're doing it in a way that's like, well, they're the, you're going to see them as active members through archival footage and music. And that's a very unique lens to look through. Um, and then we're also teaching you about what their religion really is. We give you, we like give the people the, of course they don't celebrate birthdays and holidays and Christmas. Um, and they go knocking on doors. Everybody in the world pretty much knows that but also they're a doomsday cult and also they are expecting genocide to happen soon. And they're going to be the only survivors and et cetera, et cetera. So there's like 30 things you learn about Jehovah's witnesses and how they treat women and different things in the beginning that all builds up. Okay. So here's these people, here's their music, here's their art in nuclear gopher, but this is the context they were making it in. These are the, these are the ideas that were like in their universe that they, that they were raised within and here's the bars of their cage that they're trapped within that they're slowly starting to vi realize what it really is and what the pressures are. Um, and what's like when you, you gave me a cut, I think it was, it was like spring 2019 or like midwinter or something. And it was like two hours long. You're like, I took the 12 hour interviews and I turned them into uh, two hours. And now it's, you and me need to work on cutting at least 30 minutes out of this to make it into a feature film length, maximum 90 minutes. And I was like, cutting 30 minutes out, that should be easy. <laughs> I think 
I think we spent like a year and it wasn't like, oh, this entire section can go. And then at one point you're like, what if we cut out an entire human being? Because like that would definitely make it easier <laughs> to cut out 30 minutes. <laughs> and <laughs> like, and because it, it's a lot of people, like that's also one of Ryan yeah. Duvall's inputs is like, we like getting to know five human beings all like after the next, like we don't title them very often. Should we title them more? Like, who are they? Who are they related? It's like, you only get like one little piece of information. Like I knew Cindy or I was friends with Ryan. And then like we go into this whole story and it's like, do you remember that little bit? So having five people is also a lot. Um, but yeah, like that challenge turned into like a one year of back and forth um, mm -hmm. between you and I where I would do some cuts or I would make suggestions or we do the, the, our process was this. I use Descript, your favorite app ever. <laughs> and it was a brand it. new AI <laughs> where I took the dialogue, I stripped the diet, like I took the video itself. They could, they could turn the video itself and turn it into this, the transcription text or, and you'd have them side by side and you could copy and cut and paste the text and it would move the video clips to go with it. So with that, I was able to fast and I loved that concept. It, was, it had a lot of bugs, really buggy software, lots of problems, and it didn't cut nicely, but it did help me rearrange things in my mind. And so like, that was my tool. And then I would take that text, give it back to you as a Google doc and like, okay, move these pieces here, <laughs> which I'm, I knew was a pain in the butt. Um, but also it helped me like do a thing I've never had to do before. How was that? And what tools would you recommend someone else to use or method that would be better than that? I, I mean, if this was a while ago that we used a script, I think I remember thinking, why were we using it? Simply, why aren't we just doing this in Adobe Premiere? Like, mm -hmm. why are we using this thing at all? But then I think that for you, you like to see text. I think it helps you. Yeah, it was easy uh, to cut like like what we didn't we didn't just remove a whole person. We removed like the last half of a sentence like mm -hmm. 100 times or like the he someone would say something and then they would stumble and then they would start again with a new way of saying it and we had that mm -hmm. all in and it was like, "Oh, well, I like the way he started it and I like the way he ended it, but I don't like the middle bit where they restarted or the stutter." So like I'm going to cut out just that middle bit. And it would, it would like seeing it in text was like, did it, did, did, okay. Well, let me like, okay. So Jehovah wants to kill everybody or whatever the thing, like cutting it into something more cohesive was easier to see when the text was so ter like filled with terrible grammar. So I was like, Oh, I, and I, I don't know. As a writer, maybe you can understand that. But like seeing terrible grammar and editing, that was easier than like being gripped by an interview. And like, I don't know. Also seeing it I side by side with like their facial expressions yeah, and the emotion that came me, with it. I have a question for you. Do you watch TV films with the subtitles on? Almost never actually. Okay. I was, I thought kind of maybe don't like you it. were going to say yes. <laughs> yeah. I do now, but I have a, I'm dating someone who's from a different language. So like subs are essential oh, to enjoy the movie okay. together. <laughs> right. I'm more like a no subs person, but. Interesting. I think, I find it a yeah, distraction because I'm a visual person. I want to like focus on the actual uh, visual arts of it and be captivated mm -hmm. by their visual arts choices. And I'm totally analytical too. I'm like, that's a very strange choice or like that was an amazing, like that's, I would like to do it that way in the future. You know, I'm always like thinking about making something when I watch TV. I think the thing with Descript going back to it, that would have made it an incredible tool would be if they could, put that somehow create a Adobe file with yeah. the, with the text that we cut together and then put it into a project. Yeah, so no, that, I'm totally with you. And you know, they had, that would have been they amazing. Had, they had something, but they did, they made it, they made it so like you could only, it only worked with one microphone. They basically oh. took all the audio and they m turned it into one track Mm -hmm. and then turned it into a mono track. So I had no stereo. And so I'm working with like, well, at the time it was just dialogue, but it was two microphones plus the camera audio. And so they were like mi mixing all of the bad camera audio with all the good audio. That was like, some of it was synced and some of it wasn't quite right. And, and it was like, if you put that into premiere, then we can't edit in premiere. 
because we've just lost all of our valuable audio. Mm-hmm. And they, and I wrote them so many times. I'm like, this is, this is killing us. We need, and they're like, we're never going <laughs> to add that feature. At some point they were like, we're going to add that feature. Oh my God. And then at some point they, they turned to like, we just, we don't care about video anymore. We're going to go oh, to podcasting. Really? And so they were like, oh. we don't, we're never going to add that feature. It was like over the oh, course okay. of like a year or two of using it. I started mm-hmm. using it for my podcast as well. Um, and mm-hmm. they were like, yeah, you're one of our early adopters and you're in beta. And then they went to, we don't care about you as a customer at all. Oh, <laughs> Bye. <geez. laughs> but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That would be an amazing feature. And I, I don't think anything like it exists to this day. And we're talking about six years ago, a pioneering mm-hmm. company in the AI podcast, video editing space still hasn't added the feature where you can use a professional tool integrated with their tool. It would, it's genius. I wanted it mm-hmm. so badly. You wanted it. it still I doesn't exist. It. I don't think. It was an interesting oh, yeah. uh, process using it because I think, I think the as the editor, the only issue I had was when you would go into Descript and start moving stuff around. I would have to like go and like make a little checklist of everything you did and then do it in Adobe Premiere. Yeah, and it was that was the only real issue I had with it. Cause in my mind, I was like, why don't we just do this straight in, you know, Premiere? Right. why don't we just go in and do it that way? But I think for you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, seeing the text was an important, uh, mm-hmm. aspect of seeing the story. Yeah. That, and I didn't want to mess with the pro files and your system of organization. I wanted to like, mm-hmm. here's what I think would work better. And then I would, I would like re- basically write the movie with text. Mm-hmm. like by cu- cutting and pasting and then be able to watch it and be like, I think that works better. What do you think? And it was like a separate yeah. way, place to do testing of ideas and flow of conversation. But yeah. I also felt like so overwhelmed by it because I have worked on so many short docs and other uh-huh. like one other feature doc. And then my own little document documentary with Hanoi mixtape about Hanoi music scene, which almost has no story, which I realized after making it and working on this with you with like, Oh, my first film doesn't have a story. I'm so glad I'm working with a story editor because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I don't know how to artistic. hit this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's more about music and like, it's more just like a yeah. sit back and have a joint and like enjoy like, my yeah. music, mm-hmm. relax, have it in the background kind of thing. But show, I mean, it's kind of like a travel log. Like there's not a lot of depth mm-hmm. to someone riding in a bus across like a new country for them. It sort of has that vibe to it. But yeah, like, working with you on the deep story notes. And I really wanted to hit these important parts in the story of the movie, but I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't, and like after watching it so many times, I'm sure you also, I mean, I'd like to hear what you think of this. Like I was getting like story fatigue. Like, I don't know if this emotionally hits better than the last 10 versions. Like why did, and then it was getting, for for me, it was exhausting to go back and forth. And I'm sure we both had our pulling our hair out moments when the other and like god damn it scott why are you changing it and i <laughs> definitely had some of those moments getting another version from you i'm like why did she change it like i thought we were i was happy with that but you were you were like no i'm this is a better version and i know it i'm like well what decisions did you make and why and you're like i'm in charge here this is <laughs> i don't know i don't know what the, <laughs> the, the i just imagined that but it was i was exhausted and it was frustrating but at the same time at some point i i was broken and i was like sean is in control of the story. And I'm no longer going to have an opinion. And I hate her. <laughs> <But> it, <laughs> there was definitely, there was definitely those moments, but at the same time, like it's, that's a part of giving up control. Like as a director, mm-hmm. I made the choice of who to shoot with, when, what topics to ask, um, what camera to use, camera angles, audio. I'm not happy with all of my decisions, but there's a lot of decision-making that comes with any, any creative process. And by, hiring you and collaborating in a professional way, it's important for me to give up control and to, ex- mm-hmm. and to like trust that you're going to do a good job. And, um, I think you did a great job and, ev- and that's you. a testament to like it getting accepted in film festivals and it getting winning an award, um, that like trusting your work was a good I choice. Feel, <laughs> thank you. I feel as an editor, when you work with a director, the director usually is heavily personally invested in what they have done. And when they give an editor their work, their 
project, whether you want to compare it to giving them your ch- their child, or maybe yeah. they crafted a beautiful painting and then they're giving it to you as the editor to like make changes that it's hard for them to let go. And I feel yeah. sometimes there was those moments when you, Scott, were like, you were, you were just so invested in, in these people and in this project. And when I would make changes, it felt like you took it more personally, um, perhaps. <laughs> Whereas I, I kind of had to like remain kind of harsh and like, no, like we can't keep going back and forth. We have to like make a decision. Um, and it's tough as an editor to do that. Um, it can be drain. It was draining for me too, like it, emotionally as well, because I I loved what we did together. And when you get to nearing the end, and there's like all these little tiny tweaks that are being done, it's just like now I just want it to be over. Like, <laughs> Definitely, just let's just <laughs> say it's done. But then one of us would say, "No, we got to do it better." And I I think one of the big things, kind of going off tangent here, is the coloring of it, because mm. I was kind of. Um, at the time I was working with a marketing agency and I was doing coloring a certain way that I had been trained and you coming from your photography background, I think I did a pass of the color. You were just like, this is shit. Like you need to, this isn't good in so many words. You didn't say it like that, but um, so you really pushed me, I think to like train harder and like I completely, erased everything that I'd done like hours of work doing it this one way and then I did it a different way and I was super happy with how it came out in the end so I think we were we were both growing as as creatives with this project as it was happening like me as an editor you as like the director and yeah it was it it did get very emotional by it we didn't talk for a while I feel like it was <laughs> once it was over it was like okay take it take it and just go <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> but I yeah. think that that's more because it meant so much to us I think yeah what do you what do you feel about that yeah colors was interesting um and I've I, I think you did a great job like I, I, I mean I'm still looking at it all the time um <laughs> And it's like the call it's there and it's, it not, I feel like it has a complete like harmony and consistency from beginning to end. And mm-hmm. what I learned, cause I was putting it in your hands, I'm like, you already colored this scene. And then the very next time it's different. Like Eric's purple. Why is Eric yeah. purple? I mean, it was mm-hmm. not purple. It's like a tiny hue shift, right? Like I'm being super mm-hmm. nitpicky about a particular scene, but it's like, yeah, well I filmed with like, professional lights but i also had daylight flooding in the room and Mm -hmm. shot over the course of two hours in a partially clouded midwestern town where every 10 minutes a huge puffy cloud goes in front of the sun flooding in from the window and that window light looks Mm -hmm. gorgeous sometimes and when the cloud is not there it's a different color and then there's like 14 things in the room reflecting light um differently and there's like a huge mm-hmm. pink you know window screen behind his head like there's so many things that are changing the color and so like yeah like i pulled a cut from the beginning of the conversation and put it we put it later and so like the color shift it was like yeah it's different well why is it different well then i found out you had you had to redo the color for that scene for that 10 mm-hmm. second moment totally from scratch because the there's a cloud you know, and there's, there was stuff like yeah. that with the audio too. Like there was an airplane. I spent four months just tweaking audio for a totally different topic. I was like, I cannot believe she said this important thing. And we had to use this one sentence during an airplane, but there's, there's an airport in the middle of the city and there's an airplane mm-hmm. every, every two minutes and each airplane lasts for 45 seconds. And it's like, I was filming in their apartment with all everything, all the windows and doors closed, but like that noise took, I spent a I spent five days trying to get the rid of the noise and learn new tricks to get rid of that noise as another kind of, you know, you did deep dive on color and I did deep dive on audio. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, for sure. This film pushed our limits and pushed. And, and also we both did it completely in Adobe premiere. Yes. Right. You didn't use any other apps from Adobe. I don't think I didn't um, either. 
No, no, I did not. Like Adobe Audition for audio. I did everything in Adobe Premiere, which is not mm-hmm. typical. And that's actually one of the no. things I, I would like to do, like a little how we made a film on a low budget in Adobe Premiere without any other software. Um, mm-hmm. It's not the cheapest. It's like one of the more expensive apps now in the world for this. And I'm still paying them. I don't want to be doing that anymore. Um, but I'm thinking yeah. about making a how we did it in Adobe Premiere. And I want to do it in a different software next time. I'm thinking about moving to Resolve, which is better at color. Also, yes. that's another crazy thing. Color. Like I, my first film, I learned how to do LUTs. So I made a LUT for every single, sh- every single scene I shot, every interview. And that was a lot of like 100 LUTs individual because everything had a different lighting whether it's artificial light or daylight or whatever everything's different um but then that made it have a consistency and i was like well why don't you just like you make a new lut for every scene and that's a whole different way of doing everything um <laughs> but like and you had your way and i don't know what it was and i was just sort of like okay she's doing color and i and i'm the, i get to have the final say so if i don't like it i get to say let's work harder on the scene or whatever um but it was sort of, so it was always like that chase of like time. Like I want it to be over. And you're like, yeah, I want it to be over. Why isn't yeah. it over yet? And like, well, I don't <laughs> like the scene. So it's not over. And you're like, oh, man. <laughs> all right, he's, he's pink. And I'm like, I don't want him to be pink. You're like, okay, I'll work on it more. There was, and it, yeah. <laughs> I remember getting a little sassy with you just saying, I did it. Like it's over. But then hearing your concerns and looking over it, I knew I was more angry at myself that, it looked this way and you're right. It didn't look right. It didn't look natural. It didn't flow. So the first time I did the color, I used uh, the sliders. So if you go into the color tab in Premiere and there's, um, there's like different sections on the right hand side and you can just slide temperature, temperature, hue, hue, brightness, contrast lights. Yeah. More the basic tools that you see on any photo editing app. Yeah, you can see it all all over the place. Um, and I would have some of the color graphs up, and that was how I was taught to do it. Mm. So I thought, oh, here I am. I, I, I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. And then when I sent it off to you and you were saying, like, da-da-da-da-da, this, this looks weird, this looks weird, it, yeah, I, I had to go a bit further in, so I completely scrapped that, and I went into the, the levels instead using the level graph. Mm -hmm. making the curves like going into the red channel the blue channel the green channel and kind of like which is not intuitive at all no it's when you're in that world everyone i asked who i worked with at the time when they were using the levels and the the curve graph i said well how do you know what you're doing she's like i I don't know (laughs) just like this is the like the highlights these are the shadows and then you just kind of click around until it looks good I mean, you're like I'm using sure a two dimensional graph and like just moving dots in a line, making a line have an S curve or changing yes. the, pulling the dark down, which yes. is like changing the line, be like, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I'm sure which, there which is was actually like, like, I learned how to do photo editing that way in photo yeah. photography school from an incredibly talented photographer, Craig McNitt. Um, and he was showing us on Lightroom beta before Lightroom was out. And we were using Capture One Pro and also Adobe Photoshop. So he, to- he we learned how to do it in all three apps, which had very similar tool sets. But it was like, start with curves because that does the least manipulation to the image. And then mm-hmm. like all the slider stuff that you were initially starting with, that would be like the final touches. If you needed any kind of yeah. micro tweak, you would use that at like 1% or 3% or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but you try to do everything else in a way that was like, didn't distort the digital file so much. And mm-hmm. I'd just been doing it like that way for years, like 15 years or something. So when I saw mm-hmm. like what you were doing at the beginning, I was like, oh no, no, we can't do it she's, this way. It has sucks. to be another way. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, yeah. It was, it was a good, it was a good, but emotional process, I think. Cause it did take over a year to finish right in the edit. Yeah. I think I gave you well, we did some like rough cuts and story changes in 2019 mm-hmm. and during that summer. And then I, my life was turned upside down. I moved to California and uh, started a new job that just like I was in another world. And it wasn't really mm-hmm. until the pandemic hit. And then I was like, 
yes, this is awesome. There are no distractions. All I have to do is stay at my apartment and there's no FOMO. I can just work on this movie. And I think it was like seven months or so of like Mm. really regular work Mm. to finish the movie. And there were so many times where I was like, it's done. I'm so happy. What do you guys think? Let's do a screening. And I would show some people and then I'd be like, "Ugh, there's like 25 things in my notes. Okay. I'm going to change them. Then it's done. And then I did that. Like (laughs) I were on like version 200 and 30 years. I don't know. I stopped keeping track. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot. It's like, like 50 877, but I did some decade jumps there after a while. <laughs> like, oh, we're no longer in the seven. We're in the eights now. Point one, eight point one two, eight point one three, eight point. It's eight point two now. Final. Just, no, I'm I'm final, final, final. This is the final. The final, no, final, this final, is the final. final. <laughs> <laughs> right. Was it four finals that I wrote in the title of this one? No. <laughs> yeah. Five titles. That's the finished one. Have you made any changes yeah. since I kind of finished my pass in the last Have few I? years? Yeah. So the the version that you wrapped on was the film festival version. So I asked you to kind of rush a, an edit out to get it to South by Southwest in 2020, mm-hmm. not knowing how film festivals work at all. So we mm-hmm. submitted it on the last day of the final deadline, which means basically all the films are already selected and you're just giving them free money and they're not going to watch it. So that sucked, but it was the first submission and it was my dream festival getting to South by Southwest. Um, you really want to get in the early bird when the first festival starts, first opens up submissions that you're like, people are like, Oh, that film's interesting. I'm going to keep that in like the soft slot or like that's a definite in. And then it's like every film that gets submitted later is in competition with your film. You don't want to be the film that's like competing for a slot that's already taken. You want to be the film in that slot. So be the first to submit film festival uh, mastery class that I took um, from John Fitzgerald and Justin Giddings. That's like step one. You find out what festivals you think are a really good fit for your film. And then you submit on their opening day or their opening mm-hmm. moment. Um, the programmers will start watching your stuff. They're excited. They're fresh. If you submit at the end, you're paying the most. You're having the least possibility of getting in and you have fatigued programmers. Um, anyway, so that was the cut that was like, okay, everything from now on is my job. Like Sean's been paid. She's over it. I know that <laughs> I don't want to bother her anymore. Like I, I've pushed our relationship to the brink of disaster. <laughs> I am now in charge of any kind of final bad. edits, <laughs> but I, I didn't change COVID, any color. Yeah. With COVID it was like, I think it was just like, everyone's world went upside down. Yeah. And I think, I feel like when you were like, okay, I can focus on this thing. Whereas I was like, holy shit, what am I going to do for work now? I've, I've lost mm. the consistent work that I, that I had that was paying. And now it, everything kind of became about how am I going to survive? How am I going to make money? Um, mm. Which is kind and of, you, then you have struggle. me turning on. <laughs> and then Putting you're pressure like, on I, you for the, I can do this. Da, 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 da. Like, <laughs> Scott, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just can't do it anymore. Because I didn't yeah, want to be totally fair. And say like, hey, can you pay me more? You know, and I'll totally do this because I didn't want to make it seem like I was only in it for the money, which, you know, wasn't true. But at the same time, there was this personal conflict of I need to make time for things that that pay. And it was it was really that's the struggle of being a kind of full-time artist as it is like you have to make those decisions but i am i am still very proud of what we did and the final cut that we that we did yeah me too the and to be clear about our deal it was basically hey i'm giving you a a, like a a friend price i'm sure Mm. editing a whole movie usually costs like a lot <laughs> and you gave me a, a rate that I could afford. Um, yeah. And I mostly was able to afford that with the budget of the seed and spark. I mean, not, yeah. it was probably like half that cause I was really living on a budget and not mm-hmm. paying rent anywhere cause I was traveling mm-hmm. and like, anyway, so I had made this bunch of money, went and shot everything on a super budget. And, um, and then I, when I talked to you, it was like, okay, we can, here's the rate for everything in these, it was like five payments for five different aspects of the movie and, or installments. And 
Um, but it was also clear that this wasn't your primary focus, that you had other work that was paid and that you were going to dedicate like, like one or two days a week to it when it made yeah. sense or something. So it wasn't it like a full-time gig. Have, yeah. It sucks that you have to make that decision. Cause I kind of went into this career hoping that I could just make art and help people tell their stories. But then there, there comes a, a point where it's like, well, you got to make money to survive. And I think yeah. one of the reasons why I transitioned away from editing into writing was just because it was much more flexible that, mm. you know, I could do some sort, some sort of part-time work to get some income, but then focus on my art whenever. And no one else is relying on me. No one else is, you know, I'm not slowing anyone else down because sometimes it was very difficult to say those things to you like, oh, hey, like I can't do it as fast as you want me to because I've got this other stuff that I have to do in order to be able to eat this month, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, it's a hard life, but it's not one that I would say steer clear of. It's definitely not for everyone. Um, but if you can work really hard at it, you can make it happen. I think it just so happened that COVID really knocked the sale out of, uh, the wind out of my sails um as a freelancer i don't know where i'm going with this please interrupt me at any point <laughs> i'm getting very <laughs> no, it's personal. a really interesting topic because so many yeah. people in the industry or who want to be are doing it that way or they're yeah. doing like we well, talked about like helping people tell their stories and doing art as like the goal but it's not your art it's in this case it was my art mm -hmm. right and you're a, a hired person to help make something it's not your vision it's my mm -hmm. vision and i mean your work is there but it's definitely like a story that you're not involved in right like you're mm -hmm. not a former cult member who was a musician mm -hmm. <laughs> um so so it, it's like a, when you when you first think when even like i've done a lot of creative work with other people as well like i worked on a lot of documentaries and a lot of like ngo stuff um and commercial work and like advertisement type videos and at some point I was like, I don't want to do this stuff for other people. I want to do this kind of thing for me, which is why I started this whole project. And it, and it's like, it's a lot to take on and it, you have to love it. And so like, I can totally understand that. Like, yeah, working on someone else's art, even if it's for money, isn't, isn't necessarily the most inspiring situation. Working on your own art is the, is the thing that drives us forward and so it's i think it's super important no matter what creative work that you're in that you have your own thing that you're developing to like yeah to put your passion and in, in heart into this did you find that true with your book or other creative outlets outlets yeah i i started to write during a part a time of my life where i felt like i was failing as a video editor and it all started with fan fiction funnily enough hmm. i just i was playing a video game i thought that guy's hot i'm gonna go online and look if other people think he's hot so i'm validated <laughs> stumbled into like tumblr and all that shit and i found that it was a community of people writing fan fiction it just looks like so much fun and after hmm. having so many years and years of helping other people tell their stories. I just kind of like ran with this like fan fiction thing and people really responded to it, which is why my first book is a romance novel. Cause it was kind of like, well, people really like this. So I'm going to make this into a book. But now my brain is like swirling with other ideas, like fantasy and horror and kind of more of the stuff I'm into. Cause romance mm. isn't really my number one genre. Um, and I, I think it kind of, it flipped a switch of like, I think I really want to tell my own stories, like make my own worlds, you know, mm. um, not that I, I, I it sounds like I'm dunking on video editing, but I loved my time as a video editor. I loved working on this, like piecing everything together in a way that makes the finished project work. It's, it's so satisfying. Like 
I remember the first film that I edited was my own little student film when I was like 17 or 18 and sitting behind the computer and piecing it all together. It was, I just loved it so much. So I did, and I still do really love editing and I would still do it if someone came to me and said, Hey, do you want to edit this thing? I'd be like, sure. Like mm-hmm. if I've got the time, I'll do it. If it's, if it looks interesting to me, um, I think, uh, but yeah, writing was kind of like, it kind of opened up like, no, I think I really want to be in control. Like I want to be the director of my projects from, from here on out. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was that transition, but helping you tell this story, it was really eye opening, and I really learned a lot about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, as you said before, like everyone knows that they knock on the door and tell you about their beliefs. They don't celebrate Christmas or birthdays, but listening to people who had been within it was just so fascinating. And I loved piecing their story together in a way that would engage an audience and raise awareness, but also show that, like you were saying, you don't really see many documentaries about the members itself. You tend to, you tend to see just the overarching, like this is the cult and this is what they did. And this is the leader. Whereas I right. loved working with, with you on this. Cause it was like, here are these people, here are their stories. And there's what, how they felt in that moment. Um, and here's what they're doing now. So yeah, we got Even to play kind I of both. Move away. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, we got to play with both sides. I, I, w- I wish um, that we could have gotten someone who is still inside. Like that would have made the, di- the dynamic of the documentary so much more rich. But in a way, we got that because over time, we have everyone who was interviewed were Jehovah's Witnesses. They can they can speak from that perspective, and we have archival footage of them as that doing and mm-hmm. saying things from that perspective. And also, they then got out. And then have the perspective of being out and why they got out and like the, the turning point for them. So in a way we get it all from just those same five people. Um, and we already have a, tra- a challenge with two, almost too many people in the movie to make it um, easy to follow. But um, yeah, I, 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 you're absolutely right. Like we don't usually get the insider view, even in, I think it was A and E um, cults and extreme beliefs it was a series that came out a few years ago. They interviewed, I think it was like eight or 10 episodes, a different cult for every episode. And there's one on Jehovah's Witnesses. But out of, I think it was 10, eight or 10, whatever, one of the episodes had people in the religion. And that was the FLDS Mormons, where like, it was like 14 wives of the cult leader who was in prison. And they would all together get on a video call with the prison, imprisoned leader, and then talk to their, you know, their actual husband together as a group of women is like oh my god that's that's a unique view because usually you only get the i left and it was tragic story yeah um so we get a little we did a little bit of both of that in a sense over the period of like 25 years or 20 years yeah inside and out did you see uh is it mother god on hbo i haven't seen that one it's i think it's pretty new it's three episodes but it's about a cult and pretty much all it's like a 50 50 split between interviews with people who are still in it right now and they're the family members of the people who have been affected it's very interesting Hmm. um and quite rare i think yeah but we did it that's cool (laughs) yeah 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 and that's the thing that's been really fascinating is i mean i had a vision for a film that didn't that never existed not that this film Obviously this film didn't exist when I had a vision for it, but like I wanted to make it because nothing like it existed. And I wanted to tell a story and frame it in a way that would make me proud of my past and, and also the people that are in it proud of their past. Like, Hey, there's something to celebrate here. Also it's tragic. And here's why, and here's the danger. And some, you know, there's a lot of elements to it. Um, and a lot of little sub themes that we were able to draw out, like basically everything I, I, I pitched to you in that cold Denver alley about like, here's the footage. Here's what I want. I mean, we hit all those notes and it wasn't like it happened magically and simply um, because we're both geniuses. 
um, and super talented, <laughs> but like over time, you know, we worked all those elements in and we dropped things that didn't serve those purposes. And it's, it's, there was a lot of very deliberate choices on both of our parts for why, why the film is the way it is. Um, but I, I feel I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of it. And the people that write in after they've watched it, they're like, I, I cried four different times for different, yes. completely different reasons. I'm like, <laughs> awesome. Uh, we made a film filled <laughs> with triggers. Yeah. Like we both, we both love horror and your horror film background. Like yeah. yes, we like got people to have yes. raw emotions experienced yeah. during them. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, it's like, is that a good thing? I, I think I learned about, I started going to therapy um, in in the film festival run or after going through that because I had like my first panic attack with this movie. Mm. Um, so mm. <laughs> like there's, and, and I went to therapy and I learned about like abuse, emotional abuse and narcissism, mm. narcissistic abuse. And like, um, and, the, and I think that what I, what's emerged from making this film for me and like the podcast flow, it's it's come to light after doing this project that, this film is really about accelerating the path to healing using art and art yeah. therapy without even really realizing that that's what it was. Cause I had never done art therapy and I never looked into it, but I did art therapy after going to the film festival and I was like, okay, so this is real. And I have a lot to work on personally. And I thought oh. that the film would help with that, but the film helped me discover that I like, I like many human beings um, have stuff in my past that was difficult so like, it's yeah. good to get mental health care and sort that stuff out the faster and the mm -hmm. sooner, the better starting. The pro it's not like you can finish it. Like it's probably a lifelong thing, but oh, then yeah. it's like, well, it's not just me who realized that from watching the movie or making a movie. It's like people that watch the movie are like, Oh, this is serious. I should get help. <laughs> um, yeah. and I think that's valuable. There's a lot of value there. That's not, we're not just, we're not just attacking the religion, which a lot of films on the topic do. Like we almost don't even talk about them. We just talk about like the human side of what goes on in the dynamic of the culture. Which is, which is why I wanted to put that, those little segments at the end where they talk about what they liked about being a Jehovah's witness. Cause it mm -hmm. is interesting because it's easy to, to demonize everyone within it, but these are real people who were born into it or their families got them into it. And yeah, I, I felt that that was a good call for us to end the film on a, like a, it wasn't all terrible. Like there was yeah. a sense of community there, even though there were some awful, awful things. Um, just having that, just balancing that scale a little bit. Um, having those. It ends in such a, film, yeah. The, the last like 15 minutes of the film the third chapter, as you described it, like what happens, the bittersweet, like mm -hmm. modern day reality for these people. Mm -hmm. It's like, I tell people it's like a big exhale, like, a, like, mm -hmm. okay, we've just got like, we just went through a roller coaster of emotions and experiences over the course of like 10 years of life for these people in a, you know, within a, within 60 minutes, you have like a decade of five people's lives. Um, and it was a lot to handle and we learned a lot. We saw a lot, we experienced a lot. We went through the emotions and, and now it's sort of like, we're here in the present day. They're playing music. You see like the rise of Cindy, like as like a rock goddess finding her voice and with high TV, her band high TV. And like the, all those little moments, like my, what happened to your kid? Oh, well that was like the, that was the best thing ever. Cause like the nine year old saw through all the bullshit. Like that's a fun moment I love or like that. Cindy's realizations about, um, you know, the supernatural and that she's, it was very like a, a women's empowerment, like mm -hmm. moment that she had as a young woman and like the really powerful message, even for an adult. And then Ryan sort of like, yeah, it was terrible what he went through. Like no one should have mm -hmm. to go through that, but even still he's, deeply charitable towards the people inside, like all these kind of like life philosophy viewpoints that they got from this really tragic situation that have shaped them and hopefully will shape others. Like, I feel like it, it just, it just takes all the pressure off and all the tension of the movie just like dissipates mm -hmm. into like, cool. We can be okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it was also I was, like the, easy, was I felt like the easiest the, part uh... to edit. Sorry. 
What did you say? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, ending on the, on Ryan's son, the little, you so say, you don't, you don't, you don't believe in any of it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't stop laughing when I first saw that. And I, I remember seeing it and thinking, oh, I got to end. I got to put this near the end of the film. Like, yeah, and that's through yeah, all of our different yeah. ethnics. It was like, he had that comment. Yeah. So like where you put it originally, or where it was originally, was like, yeah, that makes sense. That was what his reality was in that moment. But as an audience member, it was like, oh, that's hilarious. Like that was, I was mm -hmm. just crying, <laughs> missing someone from the cult or whatever, or like, I, I need to call my mom after this movie is over or whatever the reaction people have is. But then it's like, even a nine-year-old saw through this? Oh, man. Yeah. Like, it's in such a, it's such a levity moment because there's, like, laughter. And there isn't yeah. really much laughter in the film until the end. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's one of those choices that we make um, in the edit that's, like, yeah. That's an, it, it, I don't know why that wasn't obvious before, but it makes it better. Well, I always compare editing to doing a jigsaw puzzle. You have all the, you can have like a thousand pieces. And when you look at it, when you start, you're overwhelmed. But then once you start like analyzing each individual piece, you can start to put it together. But it feels like when you get to the very end of the jigsaw, it's so frustrating that you can't just finish it because mm -hmm. surely I can do this. There's only a couple of pieces left. Why can't I figure this out? So but they're but all textureless and they're all green like bush foliage yeah <laughs> so it's like seems <laughs> insane <laughs> like how do you yeah. get through that yeah but then when you slot those pieces in at the end and it just it just feels really good like that that's the final tweaks that we did when we was when i was starting to move things like a bit more experimentally like okay this has been here for like 15 versions but what if i moved it over here <laughs> like i'm sure it was kind of frustrating uh, for you, but also that's the challenge of filmmaking. Like always, mm -hmm. always needing to look at it with fresh eyes, even though your eyes are not fresh. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and there's something I'm doing right now. Experience. Yeah. There's something I'm doing right now, which is, um, adding a couple of people to the credits. And so I'm like, oh, I have to export this movie again. I can't believe it. I have to do this again. I was done with it a year ago. Done, done. Like I sent, I put it out. Um, and there's a version done, watch. Though. Yeah. So now it's a 2024 movie. And, um, and, and it's something that's like, it kept on growing over the course of the film. Like it was a, a Scott film with Ryan Duvall as a producer and Sean Walmsley, uh, Krubik as the editor. Um, as three, three humans made this movie, but the credits say differently. There's like, um, there's like 10 people in the above the line now, including graphics from Belgium, from Claus de Loza, and a nice. few other people that got involved. Anthony Mathenia came on as a co-producer. And um, there's a lot of people now that are in the credits. And then there's the special thanks section, which is like, well, there's a lot of people that participated in the actually be coming out series, season one. And then there's a season two. And then there's the people that really helped fund it during the Seed and Spark. And now we just did a Kickstarter. So it's like a whole other group of people that came on to help fund it. And that deserves something. And that like that really helps make the movie possible. And then there's people that have funded the Patreon, which is like an ongoing support way to keep the movie going. So the special thanks aren't just the people that like put us up for hospitality in Minneapolis when we filmed it. But like people that gave feedback or like people that emotionally supported me <laughs> when it mattered. Um, yeah. You know, like all these little things like, okay, so there's like, you know, 80 people. So like when you watch film credits, if you ever watch them, they're gigantic long lists of human beings, but they all played some part that are important. And that's what makes mm -hmm. the film better. And the version of the film that was made by three human beings that we submitted to South by Southwest was a far cry. Well, it's the story's all there, but in, and the color was there. Um, the audio is better yeah. now. There's better soundtracking. Um, there's mm -hmm. new remixed audio. There's um, accurate subtitles. There's graphics on a bunch of scenes that were not good um, with low res JPEGs that were blown up that are now like beautiful, graphically done. Someone's holding the CD in their hand images. Um, there's all little pieces that just made it all better that at some point we're just like, a low res image that we found from like archive.org and we downloaded and we're like, mm -hmm. let's put that there for now. And it, you know, we thought that that was done in 2020 and done was then 2023.
turns out, <laughs> or 2021, <laughs> uh, a year later. But yeah, all those pieces come together and, and uh, good film um, requires a lot of human beings. But you're a very yes. essential core part of that team. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for bringing me in on it. It was an honor. It's like a big part of my personal history now. So it's an honor to have you. You'll never forget me. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, um, there has been talk. Um, we'll wrap up soon. But um, Ryan Sutter and James Zimmerman from the movie, um, like they are interested in developing more of their creative side. Like their kids are growing up and um, their careers are on the tailor more tail end. And so they're talking about like doing some more book projects and horror film stuff. So there could be some like future horror collaboration with you. If you're oh, interested in getting absolutely involved. Do that. Yes. Yeah. I love horror. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool. Um, another thing I'm so curious about, and we can talk offline, but about your book, um, is it financially viable? Have you found a way to make money from literature? It's all self-published at the moment. So everything is unfortunately on Amazon. Um, you want to, is there another path that you're going to do later or is that the, the path that works right now? For now it's, it's Amazon for now. Um, I kind of like the idea of self-publishing because, uh, just being my own boss, I guess, like not having mm. strict deadlines. Um, and there's been a few authors who were self-published who eventually got signed on to, uh, publishing deals. Uh, that's kind of how I imagine it going if it, it goes that far with me. Mm -hmm. But for now, I'm just kind of focusing on kind of just getting the art out of my head onto the page, yeah. getting the stories out, not worrying too much about the money side of it. Um, getting money from a different source that's more stable and doesn't take a lot of mental strain to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So for now, it's not like earning me a ton of money, but it's uh, I can see the growth there. I've, I was put in contact with a friend of a friend who she self-published and she's been doing it for a while now, but suddenly it, it kind of exploded for her, like social media marketing, book cover design, like just tapping into like all this, the, the business of self-publishing, I guess. She gave me some great advice on what to do and how to promote myself. So right now Very I'm kind cool. of focusing on uh, just getting the story out before I start like really going into like the marketing side of everything. So hopefully it's it'll grow over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have this idea of putting together a, with all the authors involved, as I mentioned before, um, like a, I would be the first student or maybe I find a couple other people that want to write something. And then we do interviews like this about how your process is to write a book and then learn from yeah. each author, how to write a book. And then each student has their unique questions as like building a, a flow in a, in a kind of a course that's like, well, I'm inquisitive as a human being and I want to do this. Let's talk about how to learn from each other. But then like the nuts and bolts would be like a, a deeper dive into what you're, what you're learning by doing, which is that you did the self publishing, you did the ISBN number and the book cover and you're doing the marketing yourself. And, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is driving this is that the, what I've learned from distribution of a movie, this movie, witness underground is that every step of the way there's parasites who want to take your money and offer you nothing and takes your risk, um, and own your art. Um, and then it might just get shelved mm -hmm. because it's not actually making money easily. So they don't really care about it and they don't care because they have hundred other titles. Um, the movie distribution world has been like a deep dive for me. Like, how do you do it? Well, I didn't think I was going to get ripped off at every turn, but, and like, who do you trust? And like, well, people that want you to trust them, want your money up front and they, and like, they don't take any risks. So and then, and then they're always like, when you get involved with the distribution house, they're like, okay, now that you're signed on with us, here's where you need to spend your money and here's who will do the advertising for you. And it's like, and you're going to pay them. It's like, you guys don't do any of that. Of what, what is the deal? So like, I've looked at all these contracts and I've read so much that like the parallels between a book publishing company and a film distribution company, they're, they're, they do provide services and they might be a good choice. They definitely like, tell you where to spend your money 
and that might work for the machine in the industry and it might work, mm-hmm. but it might not work, but they don't, what I've learned is like, no one does any advertising for you. Um, they just mm-hmm. help you spend your money or they spend your money and then bill you later. Um, and it's very parasitic mm-hmm. and not really necessary anymore. There's a lot of technology, um, to do self-publishing. Um, the only advice I've gotten that's been negative about that is that people that self publish usually don't hire an editor and that that's sort of essential to like tighten up your story. It's lucky that Um, I'm married to a writer (laughs) who's an excellent editor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Editing. Yeah. He, my husband edited my book, which was fun. Cool. Um, But if I (laughs) didn't similar to how you and I edited the movie, (laughs) 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 a little bit more smooth, Uh, a little bit more smooth, but yeah. Uh, What was I going to say? Yeah, I, I think if I didn't have him, it would be a different story because editors require money. And mm-hmm. when you're just starting out, you might not have a big budget. So, but I would recommend an editor because he made the story so much more coherent. He saw things that I didn't, kind of like your our relationship. It was kind of yeah. like that. You would see things I'd be like, oh, I completely missed that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's still it's normal like with that. any two human beings with different life mm-hmm. perspectives and different skill sets. Like that's why a team makes a better movie, right? Or a better book. Of course. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But then you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, you get the right cooks together. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta like who you're cooking with. It's just so interesting to see the parallels between books and movies and they're, they seem completely like different worlds, but there's so many elements that are so similar in not only the process, the processes that you have and, and the goal in the end, but also like the industry of how, how the system, the system's set up, but also how like the dream, the, during the pandemic, like the dream of the nineties, I feel like became realized like, Oh, you can work on the internet and that's now normal. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's what everyone talked about in the eighties and nineties. Like someday it's possible to work digitally remotely. And, um, now it's like, I, I don't want to ever have to go to an office and, um, yeah, I, I feel like the idea of self-publishing it, it like it makes so much sense as long as you like tick a few important boxes like getting a good editor, be one of them. But like you probably you do all the rest do. of it yourself, and probably a publisher would you're yeah. not going to be successful with a publisher. You need to like do all the marketing anyways. They expect that you as an yeah. author have an audience already who want your book, and if you don't, like it's still on you to do it. Like they're not going to get that for you. It's interesting as well, because uh, when I was marketing the first book or the part one of this book, there was a lot of people who just DM me on Instagram, like, hey, do you want do you want me to feature your book on my Twitter account? Pay me fifty dollars. I have X amount of followers. Um, And it was just like I could see through it, but I can see how some people might think, oh, what a great opportunity. I'll definitely do it. But they don't realize that all those followers might be bots or they might be right. people who don't engage with that person mm-hmm. or that account. It, it's a very interesting, but very similar world. I'm realizing now that you're talking about it. Um, but yeah, you've, I think the, the big thing with self publishing is marketing yourself. It's a pain, but it's necessary. Um, social media has made it, a lot easier, I think, especially TikTok, which is strange to me that a video platform has been huge for self-published authors. Hmm. Um, book talk is is what they call it. Uh, hmm. That's cool. So yeah, learn, learning about all this this new ways of um, being able to get the word out there. And when I do really try hard to be on social media, be really active, I see my sales go up. So it's definitely working. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah, you just got to keep going at it while balancing writing itself. Right. That's the thing that's tricky. Everything I've read about having a successful YouTube channel, having a successful podcast um, is, is being active mm-hmm. in like weekly. Act, it has to be weekly, whatever you're doing to keep growing and keep the, maybe it's an algorithm thing, but I think it's also like Mm -hmm. humans are just like respond well to like 
a weekly pattern. I don't know why that is. But even me, yeah. like I, I'm a huge, I'm an avid podcast listener, probably listen to like 30 or 50 hours a month of audiobooks and podcasts. And I want the next episode next week. If I'm, you know, whatever my routine is, I go play volleyball on a bike to in LA, like bike to the beach. I'm going to put on my podcast. I'm going to probably choose my favorite podcast or whatever I'm listening to that. Oh, it's year. Tuesday. That means this podcast yeah. is out. Yeah. It just, like if it's, if it's once a month or twice a month or it's random days, I'll never, I won't think of it, but if it's always Tuesday, yeah, then mm. it's like, okay, I'm going to check. I'll remember that. Um, so yeah. And, and I'm not good at being consistent. I'm now setting up scheduling, um, a, a batch, do a bunch of podcast episodes and then I'll schedule them yeah. for once per week as like a send to the email list, send to social media, um, just to help. Cause I don't work like I'm not a weekly routine oriented human being. I am a project oriented person, um, where I'm like, this is the vision I have. I need to go deep dive into it and go do a crazy amount of creative effort and organization. And then just like be in, absorbed in it. And then I'll have some framework or like the finished product or something, you know, something new, but I, I, it's not like I I'm able to put out a piece of that every week over the course of six months and then have it. It's not at all how my brain works. I'm like, everything's off the whole world. I'm shutting all the switches off and it's just me and this idea. And mm -hmm. I go deep in it. Yeah. Interesting to talk about process. So thank you for yeah. doing that. Oh yeah. It's a process that I've never, I still, I'm not consistent. I really need to be, but it's definitely on, on book talk or on writing. Both. Yeah. <laughs> I need to, I was really good about scheduling my Instagram posts, my TikTok posts. So I was really good about writing them these days. But then when life gets in the way, it's like pff, all gone, start from zero. Uh, but it's good to talk to someone else about it and commiserate. Yeah. And it also inspires me like, no, I really need to get back into that. Let's do it now while I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I feel like there's a huge gap because we're talking about like a marketing agency which you mm -hmm. have experience, you said at a marketing agency, but like there's a whole a huge group of skill sets at a marketing agency. Like the person that writes yeah. the title of a post on YouTube or a newspaper or magazine article, like that's an entire job, spicy titles. Mm -hmm. um, we call it mm -hmm. clickbait now, but it's just, you know, like what's the headline title on New York post or whatever. Um, and there's just so much from marketing. agency. we're like, well, what if I just do all that? Well, do you have any of those skill sets? Like maybe, Maybe you're good at some of it, but probably not all of it. And, and like, can a digital nomad or like an independent creative do all of that and be successful? What I see people that are like really success, seemingly successful from my perspective or the outside have a team of people that they've hired. So like they kind of hire and pay for a marketing agency that's in, mm -hmm. that they work out of their house or everyone works remotely or something. Mm -hmm. And so, but it feels like there's this big gap between like, I'm an independent creator and I need promotion of people that aren't parasitic, that don't want your money up front and promise you bought Twitter, like followers. Um, mm -hmm. like that's definitely not it. Especially like if someone's messaging you as a creator, asking you to pay them money, they're probably not valid. Like you should be looking yeah. for them and they should be a valid thing that you can, you know, like it's the wrong direction. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's, there's some big gap between me hiring a marketing agency and being a solo person. Um, like the, it could, like that could be someone that could be someone's whole job is like actually caring about your work and wanting to promote it because that's what they love about life or something. I don't know. I haven't found that there is a, there is a woman I, I did a podcast episode with her name's, um, Marsha, um, Batch, botch her last name. Um, she has a program called write your damn book and <laughs> own your, own your life Own your something on your life. It's a great podcast. She's like three, she's done like episode 300 or 600 or something really high up. Um, and she's a wonderful human being went through her own tr like difficult stuff recently. And she has, she has incredible uh, way of doing stuff, but I love, she has this way. She like created a publishing company. Um, it was write your own, write your damn book. That's like, she had worked with so many publishers with her own books. She's like, these are all parasites. I'm mm -hmm. going to create the publishing company of my dreams and the, yeah. the publishing company that doesn't rip off authors that actually supports authors. Cause they said like, just to dive in since we're, I don't know, we're wrapping up. It's a long wrap up. <laughs> Let's do um, this. Let's get into it. Yeah, it's, yeah. 
um, she was saying that most publishing companies do this thing where they, they charge you a fee to be a part of their program to help you write your book. And also they own a percentage of the IP of that book title as like a co-author or co-producer. And so you don't own your own art, art anymore. She's like, it, it makes sense to like pay someone. She does this. She, she gets paid by people to help guide the writing process and hone it and like help with the editing and like keeping the idea consistent in, into, and also marketable. Um, and she's, she's super inspiring and does a great job, but as a publishing company, you own all of your, she'll publish your work if she likes it, but you own hundred percent of the rights to it. So like, that's cool. Or a publishing yeah. company could be like, Hey, you go write your book. Um, and then we'll take a cut of your ownership of the rights of that art to be your publishing company. Um, mm -hmm. but not both. And she said almost everyone she talked, every company she worked with was like did it double dipping and thought that mm -hmm. was super in unethical. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I want to work with you. You know, like if you're going to break it down and then create something to, to disrupt the industry in an ethical way, it's like, okay, I'll support you forever. And I'll mention you on my podcast, Yay. <laughs> but I was talking to that her about, awesome. um, yeah, she wants to help with the creation of this like book court book writing course. And she's already does her own course. So that's like, that's also cool that she was like willing to like collaborate, but yeah. it'd be cool to have you since you've got a, a you, you'd be unique in that you have a, a narrative where most people that I'm working with are, are writing memoirs. There's one other person who has a narrative that I'd like to uh, bring in. But yeah, for sure. Fun stuff. Creative. Yeah. Yeah. Artists. We're crazy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely driven to like, buy something else where like I see the rest of the world and I'm like, I'm going to buy a house and have babies. I'm like, yeah, sure. But I, w I won't, don't you want to make a movie at some point or <laughs> yeah. What's your creative outlet? I want to leave something yeah. behind. Yeah. That makes a difference in someone's life. Yeah. Thank you, Sean, for coming on the witness Intercon podcast. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'd like to do another deep dive into your author work at some point. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This has been awesome. Cool. Anything, anywhere, where can people find you and your work? I'm on Instagram at S J Krubeck, K R U B E C K. Um, TikTok is the same name. I think that's it. I think just those two. I can only handle two at a time, apparently. Okay. <laughs> and the film editing is sort of not right now, but if somebody really likes your work and they liked Windows Underground, they could possibly yeah. get you on board as an editor yeah that's seanfilm.com um that's that's about it <laughs> i don't yeah. have any so we can reach out to you there all right we'll add those in you the have links to in call the show me notes. on this very strange number and a telephone box on the corner of denver and that's how you'll reach me <laughs> works for me <laughs> yep <laughs> are you are you in uh are you in denver now i'm you... boulder Oh, wanting Boulder. to oh, wow. move in cool. more into Denver area. Yeah. Boulder is too. I didn't cool know that. I thought you were still out East cause you were in Georgia for a long time. Right. Like when we edited the film, years. it was remote. Yeah. I was yeah. in Georgia then, but now I'm in uh, Colorado again. Cool. I lived in Boulder for years. That's where you met. Mm -hmm. Nice. You lived in a very strange house with many people. <laughs> And I knocked on the door. I was like, hey, I've got a meeting with Scott today. And I walked in. You were asleep in the corner on a shelf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> oh, man. That's hilarious. Yeah, I lived at the Radish Collective. It was a little, it still exists in Boulder. You can go hang out with those people. There's, there might even oh, be really? still some core members that were like early back in the day still living there. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like a anarchist commune that sort of, morphed from its original ideologies to well, probably something more sustainable um, yeah. to keep humans, keep it running. But it, it's a really cool, ambitious uh, project. And I, I'm really, I learned a lot living there. I still yeah. think of it often. And uh, I'm still friends with some of the people I met there. I was just talking to good. one of them yesterday. Yeah. Nice. Um, but that, yeah, that's a funny way to meet me. Not, I was only there over the course of a year. Um, but yeah, it was a very different time. <laughs> I was doing some ex <laughs> personal explorations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. Thank you, Sean, again, and we'll talk to you Thank soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.